It's a very startling line in our gospel today uh, when the Lord says, everything now covered will be uncovered. You know, so everything that, that's hidden will be uncovered. And I suppose today in our world, we are kind of addicted to scandal. We love scandal. We love hearing of the fall of the great, you know what I mean? Whatever superstar it is, uh, it, it's kind of like, what, what do they call it? The, looking at a, a, a train wreck. You know, you, know it's, you know it's terrible, but you can't not look at it kind of thing. Oh, my goodness, you know. So while we, we on one, on maybe on one level, we're kind of disappointed that someone has fallen from grace. On the other hand, we're like, ha, see? And it's interesting. My goodness, how did they get away with it? What did their wife, children think? How did it all go? Where did they put the money? What did they do with it? You know, we're, we're, we're fascinated by scandal, even though it's, it's not good for us, you know. It all started with Dallas. I blame Dallas. All right, back in the day... That's where it all went wrong. Uh, but no, we're, just, we're, we're addicted to this kind of thing. Where, and it, it, it's, it's what sells. It's what make, makes news, right? So it's not necessarily what's wholesome or what's good to know, but what will sell, you know? And shock these days sells. That's why, like, for, for me as a priest, it's very... I don't... I would, I'm very, very reluctant to do any interviews with, you know, uh, with, with uh, media outlets or whatever, journalists to that... Uh, because they're not interested in me hearing confessions. They're not interested in the anointing. They're not interested in the catechesis that we do every day. They want to know. They want to know the scandal. You know, they want to know what went wrong, or you know, anyway. So all those kind of things. So they're not interested in, in ninety nine point nine percent of what I do. Uh, so they only want to know the, the shocking, scandalous stuff. So anyway, what our gospel tells us that everything that is now covered will be uncovered. Okay, so. In a way, all these things that are hidden in the sight of God one day will be unhidden. It's like, it's like your, what do they call it? Your browser history one day is going to be published. All right, what you've been looking through on the old internet, God knows it. Uh, God knows what you've been doing with your time. He's not, it's not like, you know, he knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake kind of thing. <laughs> but, but he does, I mean, he does know these things. Like, he knows what we've been doing. Uh, and one day see that that's all laid bare before him you know it's the day we find ourselves before God it's there it is it's just it's all there what I've done what I failed to do those I've helped the moments of of love and selflessness and self-giving and all that kind of thing they're there and also the moments when I chose myself chose the easy way out chose comfort they're there as well so I'm standing there before him just in this moment of absolute truth it's not like I have to defend myself it's not like he has to actually open a big book and start reading, go, oh dear, look at this. He doesn't, like, it's all simply present. My whole life is simply present. And I, I don't think, I don't really, we, we don't really know in the church exactly how this goes. We don't know what kind of a conversation is had, but it's not important. The point is, my life as it is, is laid bare. There you are. And God, in his light, in his justice, in his truth, just illuminates everything. And everything is seen as it is. The veil is taken off, the covers are lifted, and there you are. Nudo e crudo, as they say in Italian. Just, there it is. Okay, uh, all there. So, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult reality. Uh, but this then, I think, should underline the importance and the beauty of confession. Because that means then that all those things that we weren't supposed to do and the, the mistakes we made, and when we gave in to the easy way out and to our comforts and pride and arrogance and selfishness and all that kind of thing. Uh, confession actually does remove those sins. If it doesn't actually remove them, then it's a fake sacrament, right? If it doesn't actually take these sins away, then it's just a charade. You go into the priest, you say a few things, he says a few things, and you go home exactly the same. Why bother, <laughs> right? So, like, this is a real sacrament for the remission of sins. It takes them away. Like, when you think then of, 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 of how amazing that will be, it means then that when we stand before God, the mistakes that we did make that have been absolved aren't there anymore. They're just not there. They don't, they don't exist. They have been, the debt has been paid. They, we've been washed clean of them through the blood of Jesus. Like, so they're not there. That's incredible. Like, you, get, you get a clean slate every time you go to confession. It's just phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Like, do you know, what, 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 just what a grace that will be. To stand before God and like see this, it's like this little white out, uh, what do we call it, tipex, tipex uh, marks in our lives, you know, there's kind of, you see, yeah, there I was, 10 years of age, a bit, a bit of a black white out there, 
wonder what happened there. No idea. All right, <laughs> looking for scandal, you know. Then we get to 21, there's kind of a big, ch big chunk washed out there, what? And, uh, and you know, it's, it, the, the sin committed there, it's gone, it's gone. So, I just, it's, it's so interesting, you see. Today's the feast of uh, St. Margaret Mary Alcock, and she helped us to understand again, or helped the church understand again, uh, the importance of, of, of Jesus' sacred heart. Okay, so we approach the Lord's heart, a heart which is burning, so a heart that's on fire. If, you, if you've ever seen a picture of the Sacred Heart, it's still found in a lot of homes in Ireland for the moment anyway, and uh, schools hopefully as well. So you see that the Lord's heart, right? And it's on fire. It's on fire with love. And it seems, it's interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon that the heart, even for different cultures around the world, without any contact with each other, the heart somehow represents like the inner being of the person or the life force of the person, you know, even the Aztecs, like, you know, they'd sacrifice people, you know, they cut out the heart and maybe in, in, indulge in some of it. Okay. Uh, but the point being is like, why, why the heart? Why not the liver? You, you, you'll die without a liver as well, like, so, but I, no one has ever said, like, I love you with all of my liver. <laughs> you know, it just, or, um, I don't know, it just doesn't have the same ring to it, I suppose. But, uh, but for some reason, like the heart just seems to represent the kind of the, the interior life. So the Lord is, is, is either he inspired this in the first place or he's feeding into that, that understanding that we have, that the heart represents the interior life. Also in Jewish mentality, in the Jewish community, like the heart, you know, back in the Psalms, it talks about, Lord, you know, the, the, the heart of man. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's somehow representative of the deepest part of us of you as a person, of your identity, your heart. So Jesus then loves us with all of his heart, a heart which is on fire with love for us, but a heart which doesn't just love us, you know, from a throne, I'm sitting on my throne, I'm comfy out, there's uh, someone with a big branch fanning me and feeding me marshmallows. It's, 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 it's a heart that's, that's pierced, right? It's a heart that's crowned with thorns. It's a heart that has a cross stuck into the top of it. So it's a heart that has suffered out of love. So he's not just, as I say, powerfully reclining and loving us, but he's powerfully dying and loving us. So it's this, it's this self-emptying love, you know? It absolutely power, just, again, so, like so many things in our faith, absolutely astounding, you know? It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, and that's why... You see, we have to be always careful about these things to, to, not, to, never make, to never make kind of competition between what the saints have understood and what, the, the, what, what Scripture reveals. It's not that we didn't understand anything about Jesus' heart before Margaret Mary Alcock, and then this is something new. It's not something new, but it's something that we needed to rediscover. It's something that we needed to, to delve into again, just like Divine Mercy with St. Faustina. It's not that St. Faustina re reveals that God is merciful, and we didn't know it beforehand. No, God is merciful even in the Old Testament, but these are things that we need to delve into again, because it can happen that we start to focus maybe more on justice, or maybe focus more on mercy, and it's just good. To, we need to, the, the, the saints help bring us back to, to a, balanced, a balanced faith. What's another thing that's interesting about, about Margaret Mary, just to go a uh, quick recap of her life, so she's born in France in 1647 uh, into a, quite a faithful family. And she loved prayer and she even loved silence as a child, which I can't fathom. Um, but she, apparently she did. She loved silence. So she'd go off on her own and, and she'd pray. And in her young years, so she'd received Holy Communion at the age of nine. And after that, uh, she got rheumatic fever and was bedridden for four years. All right, so... Uh, in, in, like, I mean, medical care back in the day, I mean, just, just, it was simple enough. Uh, so, you know, just wait, wait it out was the cure, just. So four years, uh, she, was, she was bedridden. And uh, in that time, she used the time well, by all accounts. She, she, she prayed quite a lot. And towards the end of, of that, those four years, she promised that if the Lord healed her, that she'd give her life to him. And then she was healed. And then she was in her late teens as a healthy young woman. And her mom thought, yep, we'll get you married. 
So she went all pride and prejudice on the thing, and the mom, the mom got her dresses and ribbons and the whole lot, and out she went dancing. Remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about St. Faustina? Something very, very similar happened to uh, St. Margaret Mary, where she was, she was dancing with her frock and ribbons and all that, and then she just, again, kind of like with St. Faustina, the, the scene just kind of grinds to a halt, and she sees Jesus after his passion, and he accuses her of having forgotten him. And in that moment, she said, look, she just, she just knew within her heart, I have to do this, I have to enter the convent. So she entered the convent in Paris le Monial in, in France, and uh, began to have apparitions of the Lord, where he revealed to her his sacred heart and his desire to have this devotion spread throughout the church. <clears throat> now, I have to be kind of careful here. Um, in order to do that, how, you see, how do you, as a sister in a convent, start a worldwide devotion? <laughs> like, what's the protocol? What's the, what's the order of events? What are you supposed to do? How do you, what's the process like? So she speaks to her superior who says, you're mad. And uh, then eventually like, the, the coherence of her life, the fact that she wasn't self-seeking, won over her, <clears throat> her spiritual director, but many of her other sisters thought she was deluded. Uh, then she was interviewed by theologians and, and so on and so forth, who said she was, just needs to eat more. <clears throat> that was their conclusion. You know, she's having, yeah, 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 well, look, that girl needs to eat. And rather than, so, like, you know, but you have, have this message from God, so surely this should be easy. Why, why all this opposition, you know? And it, it wasn't really taking off as she had hoped, or as she had, I mean, again, it's very similar to St. Faustina, you know, the, the, the devotions to divine mercy took a long time. Uh, the church is a big ship, it's kind of, you, you can't steer it quickly. Uh, so, anyway, long story short, the, the Jesuits adopted this as, as a devotion, and they started to, to, to spread it. Uh, then, a process for beatification was started, and then in 1864, Four, if I remember correctly, um, her tomb was opened during just after the beatification process, and she was found to be incorrupt. And two miracles happened immediately. Now it was still another fifty years before she was canonized uh, by Pope Benedict the Fifteenth, and then the, the the devotion really started to take off. Then after that, and now is a a feast in the church, right? So in the universal church, it's now a feast. The Friday after uh, Corpus Christi is, is the Feast of, the, of sacred, the Sacred Heart. So it's a variable feast. It's not always on the same date, but it's always the, the Friday after uh, Corpus Christi. So again, it happened. It took a long time. And even during her life, it, just, it cost her a lot of pain, rejection, misunderstanding. But everything now covered will be uncovered and the sanctity and beauty of her life and the authenticity of her devotion and fervor was uncovered in time. And it was seen and her life, as it was, was laid bare and she was found to be a saint. There can be a danger that if I do good things but no one sees, is there any point? If I do bad things and get away with it, is there any problem? All things are valuable in the eyes of God. All things done out of love have a weight and a value in the sight of God. So let us live our lives in that light, in the sight of God, in the knowledge that all that we do is important, that we can console the Lord's sacred heart, that we can satisfy his thirst for souls and his thirst for love. Amen.